Hi, ladies and gentlemen. It's Dr. Julian Avoa. Thanks for watching. Today's uh, Friday, June the 17th. It's been a pretty long week. I wanted to uh, go back and make some comments related to something that happened back in January 2020. January 2020, I think it was, believe it was January 7th, 2020, was the first time that I commented on um, SARS-CoV-2. It hadn't been named yet, but uh, it, it did exist as a infection which was uh, found to be present in, in Asia at the time. It hadn't come over into uh, much of Europe, although there were a few cases, and it hadn't crossed uh, into the United States yet. And at that time, uh, I had posted something that I had said, listen, you guys got to be aware of something because it's on the forefront. I've been reading the data. A lot of really prominent doctors, epidemiologists are concerned about this particular virus. So it's it's not that I'm yelling that the sky is falling, but you guys got to be, be aware that something is on, on the forefront and it's coming this way. I even... Danielle and I even talked about an emergency kit to have everything ready in case there was a true emergency epidemic that was overwhelming because that's how it looked at the time that this virus was going to be if we continue to live the way we normally live, normal life at that time. Many people commented that I was overreacting and that it was uh, really ridiculous to think that a virus could affect anybody or a, a country, a community, a nation that much. And they lost, uh, they lost faith in what I was saying. It wasn't until February, a month later, and it wasn't until uh, President Trump uh, called for an uh, air blockade of China that people started, and, and that it was, uh, uh, at that time then, it was eventually called a national emergency, that people started to say, hey, you know, Dr. Navoa knows what he's talking about. This challenge was something that was going on for 2020, but many of you in the eShore Problems Forum have been following me since 2014, and you all know my history with eShore Problems Forum, that... Uh, we were on the forefront. I and a few other doctors were on the forefront of pushing the fact of the, the, the dangers associated with eShore to the FDA. And we were, I would have to say in my, my own, tooting my own horn, that we were significantly responsible for not only getting the word and the message out related to eShore, but getting off the market. I went to the FDA during their meetings. I and other representatives at East Shore Problems Forum were instrumental. The ladies of East Shore Problems Forum were did so much, much more work than I do, so I can't even take, I can take a little bit of credit, but as far as the medical side is concerned, because I, I, I'm a doctor, but the ladies of East Shore Problems Forum, the administrators, Angie, and uh, all of the other ladies were really, really responsible for saving so many women's lives. And if there's anything that I can ever say about how I live my life, I'm always going to remember that part, that I really did something to help. And I even, the reason that I'm saying that is that here's the next problem on the horizon. And what bothers me is that I'm getting the same pushback and skepticism from the medical community related to it. Now, many of you are aware that I'm a commentator, a medical commentator in the Netflix documentary, uh, The Bleeding Edge, which again, if you haven't seen it, I strongly recommend that you do. And uh, again, for that one, I got a lot of pushback from Bear, but I take that as a, a badge of honor that, that I was able to uh, get that much attention from Bear related to that. Uh, 
Dr. Uh, Sills uh, asked me, he was also involved at that time with Eshore. He asked me to write a chapter, as he did also with uh, Dr. Tassone and some of the uh, legal representation uh, against Eshore, to write a chapter in uh, this particular uh, book. Now, it's a little hard to read. Let me go. E Surreal Journey. And I wrote chapter 10. And mind you that this was a few years ago, but the reason that I bring it up is because chapter 10, which is the chapter that I wrote, was uh, named or titled The Eshore System Concerns Regarding Polyethylene Terephthalate in Women's Health. Now, what is polyethylene terephthalate? Well, it's plastic. It's plastic. It is the plastic component of the Eshore device. And at that time, I was talking about contamination uh, of, of the environment by plastics and how polyethylene terephthalate or PET uh, was contaminating the water system, how in 2015 the U.S. Uh, Congress was so concerned about uh, PET fibers or PET and um, microbeads that they actually passed legislation to ban the use of microbeads, which commercially were available since the uh, early, uh, in the mid-1990s and 2000s. And uh, the effects of PET on uh, the human body, women's bodies, why it was responsible, why it is responsible for uh, foreign body reactions and how it's part of the Asia effect or the auto-inflammatory autoimmune syndrome induced by adjuvants. And that was my chapter. And because of that, I became pretty well versed in the severity of issues related to plastic material in general. So what bothers me is this. Plastics, microplastics in particular, microplastics are, are, are materials that are less than five uh, millimeters in size. Okay. And microbeads uh, were when they were allowed to be used in cosmetics, in um, toothpaste, uh, and, and the such were uh, sized somewhere around between uh, um, uh, a millimeter and five millimeters in size. If you ever bought toothpaste with the little granules in it, so when you would brush your teeth, you would feel this little crunchiness of the toothpaste. And it's, mm, this, this is pretty cool. I used to think that type of toothpaste was fantastic. I, it, really, it really was interesting. I used to brush my teeth. I said, mm, that stuff, this stuff is really working. This stuff is really working. Little did I know that that toothpaste and those little granules that I was feeling uh, were not biodegradable those little pieces of material are PET, polyethylene terephthalate, beads, microbeads. So if you ever used that material to brush your teeth, you were actually swallowing plastic. And, well, so what? Well, if you understand that the, the commercial use of microplastic started in the 1990s. The reason that it was banned from the U.S. market, banned up to a certain point, because you can still find it in uh, exfoliants and uh, for some products in cosmetics, they're, they're still, you can still find them in it, not, not specifically in the United States, but there are products that are available uh, that are still getting under the radar. The fact is that we've been contaminating our environment with these pet fibers and polypropylene, polyethylene, polyethylene terephthalate, other uh, types of uh, plastic components. And it's worked its way up the food chain. It's avail And now it's in our water system, it's in the air we breathe, it's in the soil we plant, and it's in everything that we consume as human beings. What does that mean? That means if you drink water 
out of the tap water, you're going to get uh, microplastics. You're going to swallow microplastics. If you take a bottle of um, bottled water that is made out of plastic, that is polyethylene terephthalate, and you're going to swallow, depending on the brand, anywhere between 10 and 1,000 pieces of microplastic in each liter. So a 12 ounce container of wa bottled water has um, 10 to 100 pieces of microplastic in it. So that's what you're swallowing. That's what you're drinking. If the situation is so severe that each one of us on average in the United States consumes the weight of a credit card of plastic per week. So get out your credit card, get out your Visa, American Express, uh, Discover, you know, Citibank, whatever, and look at the size of that. And the weight of that credit card is what you're consuming in the food you eat and in the water you drink and in the air you're breathing on a daily on a weekly basis by the end of the year we have consumed so much microplastics that it's enough in weight to be equivalent to the weight of a uh, of a helmet a firefighter helmet is is an example that I wanted to give you again so what so what the FDA, the EPA, they have not determined that microplastics are dangerous for you. You can just swallow them and not a big deal. But that's what they said about Eshore. And that's what they said about Felshi clips and Hulk clips and vaginal meshes and hernia meshes and stents and every other foreign body that we ever talk about or whatever I talk about but again so what if you haven't heard of the issues of microplastics it's because we haven't talked about it enough but it doesn't mean that it's not a real situation worse there are health issues related to swallowing microplastics. What I'm getting at is that I'm trying to help save people's lives, just like we did related to SARS-CoV-2. This is what's on the forefront. And mind you, the majority of those that follow, follow me and Danielle understand that we don't just say stuff we you know I'm, I'm looking this stuff up I'm reading the uh, information available from reliable sources such as the FDA the EPA NOAA uh, the World Health Organization the environmental science journals the toxicology the toxicology journals We're, and of course in my specialty of OBGYN I'm reading them uh, I'm reading stuff about OBGYN, women's health. Again, so what? Right? So what? Here's the so what. The fact that microbeads, microplastics, and the, and the same are so ubiquitous, which means they're so prevalent, there's so much of it in the environment, that it has worked its way up the food chain and now, even with us drinking it and consuming it, it's starting to affect our, our bodies. Okay, it's starting to affect us. Um, here's one so what. Are you afraid when you're pregnant that it could affect your baby? Well, you should. All right, because we have found microplastics in the placentas of uh, pregnancies. We have found it in pregnant women. We have found it 
in the meconium of newborn babies. We have found it in the stool of infants. And the studies that have been done suggest that newborns, infants, babies may have 10 times the amount of microplastics in their system than we as adults do. And the reason for that is still not well understood, but it may be because we're using plastic bottles, because we're using uh, materials that are coming plastic containers and the such. And I just wanted to grab something real fast and I kind of know it's kind of hard. Okay, this is approximately 100 pages of 14 or 15 peer-reviewed sources related to microplastics. Here we go. Occurrence of polyethylene terephthalate and polycarbonate microplastics in infant and adult feces. Warning, infant and adult feces. If we're eating it, if we're drinking it, if we're breathing it in, it's in our bodies and we're passing it through our intestinal system, systems on a daily basis. That credit card that we're eating weekly has got to come out somewhere. Analysis of microplastics in human feces reveal a correlation between fecal microplastics and inflammatory bowel disease status. We have found that Women and men that suffer from irritable bowel disease, specifically Crohn's disease, ulcerative, ulcerative colitis, are at higher risk of having up to 50% more microplastics in their intestinal systems than those that don't have those conditions. Now, whether or not microplastics are causing irritable bowel disease or they're more susceptible to microplastics absorbing through their tissue because of the defects caused by irritable bowel disease is still being studied. But here's uh, another peer review studied on that. Microplastics contamination in food and beverages direct exposure to humans. Well, we already knew that because we're swallowing five, a credit card size of microplastics a week. Discovery and quantification of plastic particle pollution in human blood. Here's where it's starting to get dangerous. They're finding microplastics in our blood. Let me back up for a moment. If you have irritable bowel disease, if you have ulcerative colitis, if you have Crohn's disease, and you're, and you're more susceptible to microplastics, you're more susceptible to those microplastics penetrating the defects that you have in your intestines that increase the risk of perforation of your intestines or entrapment of that, that material into any tract or fistula that may form, making your condition worse. If it's in, now let me go a little forward. If it's in your blood, if it's in your blood, it's more likely to induce a foreign body reaction, inflammatory, inflammatory reaction. And sooner or later, again, this is the warning that we're talking about. Sooner or later, if you have a clotting disorder, you're more likely to have a problem with the amount of microplastics in your blood. I'm even, even concerned at this point that... If you have issues like diabetes and obesity and poor circulation or compromised circulation, such as pregnancy or um, issues with uh, uh, varicose veins um, or cephalic vein insufficiency, that you're more likely to develop blood clots and potential risk of loss of life or limb if your microplastic concentration continues to go up. I think I made my point, but there's chapter after chapter in the intestinal barrier shielding the body from nano and microplastics in our diet. That's a wonderful article. 
for ladies that are pregnant, here's here's one that I wanted to share with you. Uh, first evidence of microplastics in human placentas, the placenta of a human. Now we already that's a little dated now because we already see microplastics in the stool or in the meconium, meconium being the stool that a baby uh, produces while it's still in the womb. So where did that microplastics come from if it's in the meconium of the baby? The baby swallows that microplastic when it's in its amniotic sac because it's coming from the placenta uh, and from the bloodstream of the mother. So it is potentially putting the baby at risk. Again, we don't this is just the forefront of what's happening. It's putting the baby at risk. So, and then the rest of these are talking about microplastics in drinking water. Here's one for us in El Paso. Um, uh, this was, I said, I live in El Paso. Let us find out what's going on in El Paso. El Paso water. And it actually has it on its website. I circled it down there. It said, what are microplastics? And I circled it. And it says, microplastics have recently been detected in ocean seas and freshwater bodies worldwide. Municipal treatment plants remove the majority of microplastics. Conventional water treatment processes can reduce uh, plastics in the drinking water system. However, the ability to remove microplastics depends on particle size. Research is continuing. The average uh, treatment plant can filter out approximately 90% of microplastics unless they're very, very small. Unfortunately, that leaves 10% of microplastics in the water that we drink. And mind you, there are 10 to 100 times more microplastics in bottled water. So every time you think that you're, it's, you're better off not drinking from the tap, but drinking from bottled water, uh, you're actually, that's actually the reverse. So, again, so what? For everyone that asks me, what can I do if my eShore seems to induce flare-ups, or what can I do if the eShore is out and I'm still having symptoms? You have to consider, first of all, with eShore, I said, Nickel sensitivity after eShore, the the um, and you have to consider farm body reactions related to the consumption of plastic microplastics. If you're pregnant, I'm not quite sure if you should be drinking bottled water. Again, I know it sounds extreme, but you're asking people ask me a question. Uh, one study suggested that the Nestle Pure Life uh, bottle actually has the highest concentration of uh, microplastics in it. So you might want to consider that when you're drinking less uh, Nestle's uh, Pure uh, Life bottled water. Again, so what? This is why I wanted to talk to you because... I have literally listened to highly prestigious, highly intelligent, board certified doctors have absolutely no idea that microplastics are in our bodies, that we're consuming it on a daily basis. I have board certified, I have heard board certified OBGYNs completely clueless to the fact that we've already published data showing that microplastics are in the placentas of babies, they're in the physical bodies of babies, that they're in the meconium of babies, and that they're in higher concentration of our babies than in the adult mothers that, that bear the, those babies. Where are the where is the lay person supposed to go to get information that we as the professionals should be providing? What's happening is that we as doctors are so fixed fixed in our training 
and fixed in our specialty that we can't think outside of the box. We're like a bunch of Pied Piper followers as doctors. If the FDA says that it's okay to use, then we're going to okay to use it. That's what happened with the hernia meshes, the vaginal meshes, with pet, with a uh, 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 Eshore, with Hoka clips, with Felshi clips, and we're literally responsible as doctors for harming patients out of our plain stupidity and arrogance. We don't, as doctors, don't read enough. We assume things as a status quo and we never take the time to look beyond our own arrogance. So I'm telling you today in the forefront of warning that it's time to start thinking about microplastics and can it harm you and it does it harm you and at least for pregnant women do you want to start the life of your babies with microplastics with them exposed to microplastics even before they're born I don't know what the answer for each individual person would be but I would have to say that it's an important consideration. Now, I'm not suggesting that you completely eliminate microplastics because you can't. We, as a, as a, as a species, have decided that convenience trumps safety, and we're allowing the, comp the consequences of that to affect our lives now. But as microplastics continue to be circulated in the oceans and in the air we breathe, and this worse here in El Paso, mind you, um, with these desert uh, storms that are going up, approximately three to four percent of that uh, that air that we're breathing in has microplastics in it. So, what another one of these studies here uh, talks about uh, microplastics in the in the, the the filtration systems of our bodies, in our lungs, in our liver in our kidneys, and in the spleen. It was a great article that I read there, too. So I don't know if you're really going to care. I don't know if it's really going to affect you. All I'm saying is that you have asked me to give you information that I think may affect your lives, and that's what I'm doing. So I hope that we end Friday with a big God bless to everybody and that everybody stay safe. But I want each and every one of you to start reading up on this. And if you happen to be pregnant or you happen to have a baby, be real careful with how much plastic exposure you're allowing your children to because, because of their body sizes and everything, the concentration of microplastics is higher in their bodies because of their simple sizes. And they're in many cases have a lot more exposure to plastics than we do. It's going to come to a point where there's so much microplastics that we're exposed to and the fact that it's already accumulated in our tissues that it's going to cause people to start dying. I don't know when it's going to happen, but it's going to be, it's, the, the effect will be similar to the infectious nature of uh, SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. God bless you, everybody. Have a great weekend.